Okay, this would be a frustrating presentation. There's no conclusion, there are hopefully a few insights, and if I don't have a call to action, that you should really end these kind of things with, especially in an organization like this. I will end with a question, and I hope that we will jointly find the next steps forward on how can we use automotive, so how can we use open source to engage and define the next generation of automotive software? I didn't get a clip of the next program very long. I don't know. Sorry. Let me try again. Okay. So I need to start with a disclaimer. Uh, I'm Magnus Boyer, by the way. Uh, I work at Volvo Cars since three weeks. I'm going to play this very, very safe today and say that I mostly speak myself. I'm sure there are opinions shared inside Volvo, but I kind of sort of represent Volvo today, but not really. So I just want to get that out of the way. So what is a breathing gun to a software-defined vehicle? It's different things depending on who you ask. There's a business perspective of it, and you can read just as well as I can out there. And there's more of a technical perspective, which I'm more interested in. But there are other parties out there who say, no, 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 it's more of a platform, it's virtualization, it's awesome. For me, it's all about the APIs and the interfaces and how to open up what is proprietary, close box and wheels, so you can do cool stuff with it. Again, it's a young field, it's evolving, we're going to look a little bit into that. Your definition may vary from all. So, what's happening inside software defined vehicles? There are a few things that's going on. I would say that there is a big outreach going on between the OEMs, especially the European ones. I've been in several meetings. I used to work at Ambition, which is Mercedes, and before that, I worked at Toyota and General Motors. I have a number of OEMs in my experience, I guess. And what we're all looking for is a higher starting point. We don't want to develop our own operating systems, definitely not. We really don't want to develop our own app systems, speech, and all that. But we want a way to tie all this together into a higher starting point so we can focus on what makes our products, cars, better for the end customer. So we spend our development money on the right thing. And development money is not spent on Bluetooth side, we're building that again. We take UZ or whatever and we integrate it. We want to spend stuff on the differentiating things on the top. We want to share cost and risk. Of these differentiating things, Bluetooth is a very good example. Nobody pays back. It's supposed to work. It can only be bad or not noticed. And it's usually somewhere between not noticed and I hate this car and I want another one. We want to share that to get on with the Bluetooth stack. We want it easy to integrate, and we want it to work with different antenna configuration, and UWD, and everything else. That would be so nice if we could get that. Uh, but strangely enough, platforms haven't taken off. For all of us, it's like, well, AGL lives in the front code base. We should just be able to take that and work on it. It turns out that, theory a little bit, that downstream, or sorry, downward in the stack, toward the hardware integration, and upward toward different kind of very specific uh, applications, there's too much stuff going on. So to integrate one of these stacks takes a lot of work, and usually end up with a stack that's so customized it doesn't really resemble the code base you started with. And now you need to drive this with you with maintenance, you almost have like a code for it. And it's really hard to maintain. So for some reason, these platforms haven't taken off. So, who are the Well, some people want to provide technology, some people want to standardize, and I'm, I'm not saying yes, I want to provide both tech and standardize, but I'm going to explain why uh, it's hard for us to provide technology in the open source. Some people want to provide in vehicle platforms for standardization, virtualization, oh, cloud, that's good too, we want that, they want to be everything. A few people want to coordinate and run the whole thing, the World Economic Forum. I've been in most of these, but I don't know, not Sloffy, and others have been in a couple of times, I think. Um, but the World Economic Forum tried to tie all this together, very Eurocentric today. But we are seeing, as I said earlier, that there is a big 
push for self-confined vehicle where they realize we can't do this in isolation. I'll get to that. We need to work together. And so now it's this big buzzword going on in the industry where it's like, oh, there are two people with this, and Volkswagen over here, BMW, and Toyota. And they try to make a scramble. And we, for once, realize that maybe we should not try to kill each other in this one, in a kind of standardization world. Maybe we should try to collaborate. And we are looking and trying and trying to figure out how are we going to do this the best way. So there's really a willingness to collaborate, which is good. Because if we were fighting each other at this point, it would be dumb beyond recognition and very, very expensive and very, very risky. So, <clears throat> open source. We have in the automotive thing a huge thing, especially in the EU, hanging over us, and that's the antitrust laws. I have been to countless trainings of what I can talk to and what I cannot talk about with other OEMs, tier ones, etc., in private. I've had a few meetings peer to peer with other OEMs regarding how to standardize something in this world. Attorneys were at place. We were crying before what we could and could not talk about. After a protocols were published, as it had to be, and everything needed to could be kind of opened up. It was a very expensive meeting and not very productive. And if we're going to do this correctly, everything has to be open. All the protocols need to be published. We, if I'm going to share a repo with anybody outside of Oldham or Mercedes, whatever, it has to be shared with everybody, or else we have a huge red flag. And no one can be excluded from technical business conversations. We are forced and this is good, to have a false mentality when we work on standardization, both the technical and specification side, and the coding side. Or else we're going to get into an endless world of pain, and with legal and a lot of other things. And we really don't want to be there. So, what are the core technical software-defined vehicle principles? Remember, there's business definition, some people view it as a number of other things. And really, it's basic stuff. Separate the APIs out from the implementation. Make sure you negotiate between, there's 100 plus ECUs in the car today. Negotiate using the network bindings in this case, which is an API, uh, between all these ECU providers. There's usually about, I would say, a large organization, six and 10,000 people working on all these ECUs in total. If you do the contract and all that, it's a fairly large project. Don't negotiate wrong requirements because those are usually, especially in the beginning, very vague and not really testable or atomic. Don't negotiate wrong implementations because those are just buggy. Negotiate wrong API. And evolve specification of implementation. It's very waterfall -y still in our model. They have the A slice, which is the, the D model. There's nothing stopping eight spice from actually being quick iteration, a little bit agile, but the mentality and the culture, which I'm going to talk about at Lisa, of automotive is to do it once. You spec your gearbox, you build a prototype, you have requirements, you move the production, and you go on. And if you're going to take another iteration because your gearbox goes up, it's a failure, it's expensive, it's bad. And that mentality is still in the head of automotive when you do software. So we need to decouple software, especially software products, platforms, frameworks, stuff like that, that have different cadence and different objectives than the traditional mechatronic automotive engineering, which is one pass, make it work, ship the car. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we just need to catch up with the rest of the world. We are so conservative because we've been building cars for 130 years, and it's been going kind of okay up until this, you know, entertainment crap and Apple started releasing the iPhone and not the actual big focus on this, that's when things started to fall apart for us. How am I on time? Ten minutes in. So, where can we contribute? Money. It's that simple. I, I can write beautiful little words, but at the end of the day, if I want to develop a new version, of an entertainment system, and I've done this by myself. It usually ends up, if we're going to do an uplift, new version of an operating system, some really cool new features, like uh, ARL, something like that. We have an existing code base that's in the market. It usually starts, if you're going to be serious, at 200 million euros in development cost. 
if you want to build a full blown system from scratch, the most expensive I've seen is $830 million. If you want an organization on top of that, so you not only build the software, but you build the machine that builds the machine, it's way beyond a billion. For us, I'm not speaking about all of them. For to blow, but for us as an industry to invest, not blow, invest a billion dollars in the promise of open source project, it's a rounding error. Money is not the problem. What is the problem though? Well, we do, it's probably a better term for this, directed open source. We realize that we need to share risk and cost. I'll use vSum IP. Some IP is a protocol that I have a strong opinion about. Uh, it's a standard RPC protocol that pops up on smart bits. This is nothing special. VSUM IP is the main implementation released by BMW a while back, a long time back, maintained by, I think it's in Visa right now. We need to maintain our protocol 10 years to 15 years after the last car rolls off the assembly line. And that last car may just be developed now, so it's two years until we start developing, start building it, five years production, 10 years after that. We need to make sure that we can bug fixes, secure the fixes all that time. Open source makes people nervous. Here are a couple of key projects that we are dependent upon. We better invest money in that. We will plow in middle money to get maintenance, bug fixes, support of this as we move forward. But it's, it's a very tricky proposition. I often hear, and I talk to a lot of people about this, why should we pay for it? It's free, right? And even worse, why should we invest in it? It's free. No, it doesn't matter. It's usually, I would guess, this is a really rough guess, but about 20 to 30 percent of the code that we execute uh, inside the entertainment system is open source. It's massive. System is massive. It's about 100, 150 million lines of code in the entertainment system today, including in Kerbal. But I have a hard time explaining what's the return on investment. If I could do that, if I could come up with a business case, remember, a million dollar here or there is not much in this context. But I have a hard time explaining to these old school mechatronic automotive engineering people why open source. And we're going to go explain a little bit why that is. <coughs> Sorry, we're not going to explain. I think I'll wrap this up now. We're 15 minutes in. So, as I said, this is a frustrating presentation. How I want to move beyond directed open source. I want to get to call it an organic open source that's initiated and maintained and driven by the community itself. And the automotive industry go, ooh, that's interesting. Let's put some more people in that. I haven't thought of that. We want innovation from open source. Us, sponsoring some IP or some you know, pipeline or whatever that we use is an innovation. It's a risk mitigation. It's an insurance premium that we pay. And I can take that any time of the day with proprietary software, because obviously different beasts and completely different set of problems. But I don't think we're leveraging open source in a way that we really, really should. And right now, for some organizations, open source is just an intellectual property clearinghouse. How do we make sure that we can you know, give uh, some IP out and take some IP in without getting into trouble with antitrust laws, getting sued for, sued for IP infringement, etc.? That's not open source. That's a legal construct. What I need to do is to demonstrate the value, the return on investment. If we're going to open source anything, framework, platform, whatever, we can't just throw it up over the wall because we all know it doesn't work. We need to set up community management. We need to set up maintenance. We need a commitment that runs for three, five years at least for ourselves. If nothing else, remember, 10 plus years. And that's cost. And it's risk because this distracts us from the big thing, which is to start a production. When the first call rolls off the line and we can handle the keys to our customer, we can all accept. Up until that point, it's crunch time and it can last for a year easily, 18 months I've seen. The burnouts and everything that comes with it. If I come to my bosses, you know, head of automotive software, head of engineering, etc., director of engineering, and say, hey, we should really divert 10, 20 percent of our funds <coughs> at time to do proper maintained open source engagement, they're gonna go, why? I don't have the answer to that question. 
And I would like to talk to all of you about this, but how do we do that? It's very specialized what we do. These might be no use outside of the Don't ever use it as a PG or PC or anything else. It's not suited for it. We have, uh, I think it's DLT, it's called the Diagnostic System. Cohesa as well. There's a bunch of other things. We obviously bring in open source, Wayland and lots of stuff, and uh, Pipewire, and a lot of different components, from AGL and other components, but that's just integration. But what we actually develop inside and what we push for is so narrow and so focused that I can't see the use outside, which means that we have a limited uptake in FOSS, and I can't get this organic growth, this organic innovation, which I really want going. And I don't know how to do that. So please help. I think that sums it up. Thank you very much. And I'm on time, which is a change. Thank you. Good time for questions, and I see a question from a guy with a top car movie. Not to involve So the situation changed a little bit when you're talking about the governance and other things. So a few months ago, we had CIA competing against open source theory. I'm sorry, a few months ago? A few years ago, a few months ago, we had CIA competing okay. against open source theory in general. Matters. Now, with the change of text, CRA actually is enforcing exactly what you're saying. That says the companies, even if open source the code, are responsible for the open source code that they're releasing, yes. or the community itself. So even trying to push it as a pushing communities and governments and everything else, we still responsible in yes. the open source. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a copyright sign at the top of the code. And one thing, we, there's an intense discussion going on, uh, well, at least in my mind, about how do we do this. And what we're talking about is outward versus in. We get together, for example, in Belize, and we say, hey, we're going to do IFEX, which Gunnar Anderson is doing, the Inter Interface Exchange. Well, I see that it, so I'm, I'm completely biased here, but it's awesome. And we, then we get people to adopt it, right? And that's problem, not invented here. You know, BMW is like, ah, we're doing something similar, not going to do that. And GM is like, oh, nice, but can we do this instead, etc. We're thinking about why not just switch it and internally set up the organization to go, yeah, we're going to start on the sourcing stuff that we think other people may be interested in, both organizations and commercial entities and private people. But as you say, still own it, can't just dump it. And we need to, we cannot do this without doing the investment of showing up here, of setting up workshops, events, maintaining code, recording news, merch press, all that it needs to be going, and it's a long-term commitment. Else it won't work. It's going to be dead code and frustration. And it's going to be a risk for us because we now have code that we need that we need to maintain. And it's in the open that it's kind of in a zombie mode where we need to push money into it on our own, but we don't get any benefits on it. I have one more over here. It's good to see people, it. <laughs> it's good to see people that haven't given up. Give up. Uh, once again, I'm sorry. That it's, it's good to see people that haven't uh, given up uh, on, on, on this topic in you know, Um I have. <laughs> um, so two points that I, that I, uh, I work a lot on and, and had some minor successes. See, once you start, once you learn about how a company, car automakers, innovate in the mechatronics, you realize that their innovation cycles are insanely big and the investment is absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. And somehow they get some return to competition, right? Formula One, rallies, all that. So, and when you go there and you go deep there, uh, you realize that there is an insane amount of knowledge share and standardization around those competitions. And the amount of differentiation is very, very small. And when you translate that concept into open source, they can relate to it. Yeah. It's just that uh, it's done differently, but the concepts are fairly, pretty much the same. Yeah. That's, that's one, one uh, point. And the other point is uh, when you try to uh, work on, on the collaboration front, on the open source front, and especially in, when you think about maintenance, the truth is that OEMs do not know the economics of maintaining something. Yes. And until they learn that, it's impossible to convince them 
of working in a sustainable way. It's yeah. just impossible. And there are two ways of learning that. Either you bring partners and have them into that business for a very long time, or you hire people that have been into that, those business or into that business for quite some time, so you have been at least on one of those crazy cycles of upgrading end-of-life software and can tell you how much it costs. Yeah. And if you do the second thing, you give them responsibility for the decisions. Those, so it's it's that to, to try to uh, convince somebody that do not understand the economics of maintenance and support software uh, to, to do software in a sustainable way. And that's, that's something that I came across time and time and time again. Yeah. I was just telling things that they didn't understand because they never did it before. And the numbers are not, when, when you start working on the numbers and showing numbers, they are uh, counterintuitive for them in some ways. I agree. What we are up against is not a financial issue or even a willingness. I mean, I've been talking very hard about the Mercedes lately. Even if I have set up the initial, and it didn't take off, but the initial open source policy there. Um, and a condition I was driving the open source operational side. Every time all the OEMs have an open source organization, it's all about risk mitigation. The problem we're up against is not a financial one, it's a calendar one. We have a strong production, it's immutable. If you ever want to see a hard deadline, look at the car factory with 5,000 people waiting for you to finish the software, 20,000 tons of material in the backyard, pre-orders, and so much capital bound up, we wouldn't believe it. And if you come and say, oh, it's going to be five months late, it starts at a small OEM today at about 1.5 to 2 million euros a day. You're late. The screening is insane. And if you're a big OEM, probably five times that, easily. How do we convince these people that even when everything is on fire, you need to reserve 10, 20 percent for long-term development because that's what this is about. That has a return on investment beyond store production. You need to do that. Um, picking a bit from my speech at Polisa, by splitting up, have a software product which can be internal, lots of open source. Well, most of it, if not everything, should be published open source. That is funded by R&D, not the car lines that actually produces the car, and have them released on their own cadence, maintain their own thing. With each release that goes into the integration project owned by the car line, they send a team, a support team. That support team works with the integration team to get the platform, the software product, plus all the features, apps, and everything else tested, certified into the car and on. That's the split. Problem is, when things heat up on the start of production, which are always late, you are pulling in the product team. All hands on deck, show up and sit with thing at 8 o'clock Monday morning, all of you, we need to control this. You micromanage, you can kind of be scoping, a lot of other things. All our strategies, willing to collaborate, open source mentality, because it's not going to I have failed so far to protect strategic development, of which open source is a part, against the tactical needs of the automotive launch project. Um, it's, it's so frustrating. I mean, we've been having it for 10 years now, and I haven't found a solution. We have bits and pieces, but it's not there. How much time do we have? Well, we have 34 minutes. Okay. Uh, there was one hand up there. Me, I, can, I can set that from my app, etc. 
So STD is already a thing. The question is now, how do we push deeper, and do we need to push deeper into ADAS, autonomous driving, uh, propulsion, battery management, things like that. And now it comes down to how much do we want to open this up to other people, other organizations, super, super scary. ADAS system kills people if you get it wrong, and you do. Um, even if the system will kill your kids easily. I know one, oh yeah, that shall remain on name. We had a black screen on the backup camera. Actually, it was a freeze frame, which is really dangerous. The camera froze on the backup screen, and the individual backed over their own kid. This, it's two tons of death. We need to get the code right. And when we say we need to open this up, we all go safety, security. And safety, a security issue, which is a whole different thing, in our loading, very, that's loss of money very quickly turns into a safety issue, which is loss of life. Because I have a vehicle, hey, let's you know, take all this gear with, with the park system, etc. We need to figure out internally what are the next steps, what do we want to open up, how do we access this from the outside, who access this from the outside, who needs ADAS, who, what kind of services want to provide onboard and offboard additional code to interface our ADAS system, fleet management, car sharing, stuff like that, possibly we need use cases. Once they have the use cases, and those are backed by business cases, because it's a commercial entity, then we can start looking at how do we continue to expand this. Internally, we are already working on it. API first, start to work, you know, make us, as I said, negotiate around the APIs. And that, but that's with trusted key, we have you know, key exchanges all encrypted and all that. So we have a similar SDD approach, which is much more uh, evolved, let's put it that when we work internally between tier ones and between organizations inside the company, because it's the same thing, it's just a different zoom now. But I don't know what the external SDD definition will come in. We're still working on the basics, getting the tooling in place and the mentality in place. So it's going to be a couple of years. I'm sorry I couldn't give you a better answer. Yeah, last question, I think we have. 20 so, seconds. So, how do you see the changes that is actually will happen? It's like 48 V in, uh, in cars, different harness, no compass anymore because it is an internet. And it's, it's everything is coming. That's completely changed everything, that even the software. Yeah, it's, the 48 volt system is a good example. So, the reason why they have 48 volt system instead of 12 volt uh, to drive things such as steering is that there's so much power involved now. So steer by wire, which is side of the first out, which also has 48 volt, requires a couple of horsepower, so it's a kilowatt level of steering to make sure that actually wheel turns the electric motors. There are huge differences in the electric architecture in the wheel, uh, in, in the car, and that changes every day to generation, and we tear our hair out. Just recently, we had a new steering wheel, same buttons, same feature set, same thing as cost to use, and obviously a lot of buttons and touch and happy and stuff like that. Every single cam frame, so think UDGIP, different payload structure. So we had to rip out a lot of code, redefine the cam structure, the, the protocol payload and the, the codex, just to be able to do, you know, set speed or increase volume, which is the same old function we always have. What we do is we tend to also internally gateway this. We push down to zonal controllers, edge controllers that control all these mechatronic bits, and we run a semi-standardized internal protocol between that and a higher level compute elements that does command and control. So we try to isolate the weird bits that change behind a gateway. We're out of time. Thank you so much.